Hi, Pam. I'm so excited to have you on our podcast. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about you and your pony, Stella, um, and the big, big, big journey that you guys have had together getting to know each other. So before we get too far into it, do you want to tell us a little bit about you and Stella and your horses, your experience as a rider and a horse owner? Sure. Hey, Katie. <laughs> Um, so I have been riding for ever, for almost my whole life. Um, I have done pony club and I was a riding instructor and I did eventing, dressage, hunters, you name it. And then one day I met a pony named Stella and decided that, uh, she was perfect and I would bring her home. And I, um, thought that we would have a magical, wonderful relationship. And she almost immediately developed an ulcer, um, like within days of me getting her or possibly on the trailer ride home. I have no idea. So um, I had this pony that I barely knew that I had only met twice. She shows up at my barn and she was an absolute nightmare. Um, I had no idea she had an ulcer. I thought that was just her. And I started to get a little bit concerned about the fact that I had uh, bought this pony who obviously hated me and had wanted nothing to do with me and didn't even want me on her back. Uh, so that's the background. Um, <laughs> luckily, I also, <laughs> um, I've got a couple other horses. So I was, um, I was able to at least convince myself that I wasn't a horrible rider and horse owner. You know, I did kind of know what I was doing. Uh, so I try not to let it uh, get to me too much. And onward we went uh, with our journey. But I do, um, along with Stella, I've got uh, two, I call them my oldies. They're Sunny and Q. Sunny is going to be 29 in June and Q will be 30 next month. Uh, so they're both retired. Um, Sunny is a paint horse and she's the absolute love of my life. Um, she's the most hilarious horse I've ever owned. She's completely neurotic. Um, she was given to me by a student of mine who just couldn't tolerate her anymore. So that's <laughs> kind of the background she was coming from. She literally called me one day and said, like, can you just come and get her? And I said, sure. Uh, and I've had her ever since. Yeah. Um, and Q is a quarter horse. And she, um, I was a working student at a local dressage barn and Q came in as kind of my summer project. Um, so she was a reigning horse. She knew nothing about dressage and I had to turn her into kind of a school pony for our little dressage riding school that we were running. Um, and she was a bit of a nightmare too when she came, but, and I don't know if you know much about reining horses. And I know if anyone's watching this who rides reining horses, they have a lot of really um, weird buttons installed. <laughs> and I had no idea how to ride her. Like she would, <laughs> My coach made me ride late at night when no one else was in the arena because she would just randomly go forward or backward or sideways or start running in circles. And I had no <laughs> idea what I'd done to make that happen. Um, so anyway, we got through that and she actually turned into a really cool little um, lesson pony. And then I left that barn and Q went her own way. And then we kind of met up together one day at my coach's barn. I realized that she was actually being boarded there. Um, and her owner was kind enough to let me start riding her and showing her, which I did for a number of years. And then when it was time for her to retire, she just made her way here to my farm. And now she's in my backyard, too. So all three of the girls now live in my backyard um, doing their little horsey thing. So, That's so lovely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I think, um, you know, it's interesting that we can have, you know, years of experience under our belt and come into <laughs> a relationship with a horse and realize we know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Exactly. It's, it's so strange. Like I really did. Um, and I'm a pretty competent rider. Like I'm, you know, I generally tend to know what I'm doing and then you're right. Like I just, 
here was this horse. I thought like, what on earth do I do? Like I've never, I've never been in this situation before that I just did not know what to do with a horse. Um, And it was, it was made worse by the fact that, um, so I, I bought her, she got the ulcer. We didn't know she had an ulcer. I moved her to my trainer's barn. Everything blew up. So then I moved her to a friend's place um, who's got a breeding barn where her horses just kind of run free. And we just threw Stella out with the herd and left her there and, and allowed her to start to heal. Um, in the meantime, we bought our own farm. So by the time I got Stella here, um, you know, I had been used to riding with my coach three and four times a week. I had been used to constant feedback from my fellow riders. And so here I was with Uh, no coach. My coach is now an hour away. Nobody else here. Um, So I didn't even have that feedback. Like I was, I was literally just stuck. I was like, oh crap. What do I do? (laughs) Yeah, totally. I, I so hear that. I, um, one of the things that I tell my students that get a new horse is that it takes 12 months before like you really start to know know them and it's like that excitement of you know looking at the ads and you're looking at all of these beautiful horses and you're thinking about all of these amazing things that you potentially going to happen with this new horse and all of those daydreams and and then like and then reality happens and (laughs) you know what you should be doing as a rider but it goes so much deeper than that when you know, it's your horse, it's, as a trainer, it can be a lot easier, like when you were working at the dressage school and that kind of thing, with just like jumping on the horses and giving them a tune up, you know what you're supposed to do, you just make the buttons work and and you carry on. But when it gets into, you know, the depths of that horse owner relationship, it's, it's just like any other relationship where you either, you know, you either grow from it, or you like, just end up at loggerheads and it feels impossible to to move forward and I think like as writers especially like those of us that have been in it for a long time you know we we kind of end up in a little bit of that safe zone of like just expecting what a horse should do for us because it's a horse without realizing right. like the nuances and the subtleties that have happened to get us to that point with a particular horse that we've had you know a relationship with like I think about you know the journey that I had with King and he was he was so rogue like he dragged my granddad up the alleyway because he didn't like being held I was like granddad let go let go and granddad like getting dragged (laughs) up the alleyway and and he would um you know because we couldn't tie him up anywhere he'd be the horse at the showgrounds that would like just slip his way out of the <laughs> stall <laughs> and then just be like running hot laps or, around the showgrounds stirring all of the other horses up and you know you kind of go like through all of those experiences and you think that you're learning how to handle horses but you're kind of just developing a relationship with your horse more like you, you get tricks that work for that horse but it's like yeah. that you know how you kind of bounce off of each other to figure out how to move forward to together and then you go and transition into like getting a new horse so when king was too old to be ridden anymore and I ended up with fitty i was like yeah i know how to ride but that doesn't mean that fitty wanted me to ride him <laughs> and so we, we had to go through such a, a big journey together as well like to get to that place where you know fitty liked me and and wanted like we we haven't like broached that conversation yet about him inviting me into the saddle but we're getting to that place now where he likes me <laughs> and I think like trying to have that conversation as well with people you know having a horse for the for the first time especially coming out of like a school environment because the like school horses are special horses to be able to let so many different people ride them and to just like be so compliant and willing and 
you know, in, still somewhat engaged in, in the lesson, even though <laughs> they're like three kids deep, but <laughs> they're still trying to like help help the kids learn how to balance and, and stuff like that. Like it's a really special horse and it, you know, something that I have become aware of as the instructor in that scenario is the horse's relationship is with me as the instructor, not the kids. But then those kids are going right. getting their first horses. They know how to ride, but they don't understand like the relationship building aspect of it that happens when it is your horse. Exactly. Yeah, no, it's so true. Um, and, you know, as as trainers, you, you do if you've got 30 or 60, 90 days to put whatever buttons on the horse the owner wants, there really isn't, you know, there's no time for building a relationship. You just have to get the job done. And you're right, you know, with school horses who are, school horses are really, um, they're worth their weight in gold. I mean, oh my gosh. Um, But you do, you are the one who has the relationship with them. I remember I had this little school pony once, her name was Crystal. And she um, had come to us. She was just a holy terror. She was terrified to be ridden. And it took me a long time to get her to the point where I could actually put little kids on her, which was her job. That's what she had to be able to do. And, the, you know, we the things that she and I went through to get to that point, um, you, you'd never, the, the kids riding her would never think that they would think, oh, I get on and I ride. And you're right. Then they go off and get their own ponies and they think, oh, this is going to be just like it was with Crystal. But no, 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 no. Because Crystal was my, <laughs> that was my relationship you were building on. You've yeah. got to now figure out how to build your own. It's, yeah. I think it's a, a tough realization for people when they do get their first horse yeah. or their 10th horse yeah. or whatever. <laughs> yeah. And then we get another horse and we go, oh, that's right. We've like spent the last four yeah. years getting to like each other. <laughs> we have to do that all over yeah. again. <laughs> um, so Stella, um, can you um, tell us a little bit about her age and her personality and her breed? Sure. So she is um, part Connemara. I always say she's part Connemara, part unicorn. Uh, <laughs> she is the perfect little gray pony. Like she's she's 13, going to be 13 this year. I got her when she was six. And uh, she's she's grayed out so much in those years that she's now almost completely white. And I literally I expect to go out to the to the barn one day and see her unicorn horn <laughs> has developed now. Like she's she's really the perfect little when you picture like a child's first pony. This is this is what she is. And she's chubby and she's adorable. And she's got, you know, this huge mane that grows out on both sides. She's just wonderful. Um but she's she's a funny pony. She um she's very sweet in her own way. Uh, she's a little bit high strung sometimes. She's a little bit on her toes. She's quite um, curious, which in the beginning I would have said she was reactive, but she's she's turned into a very curious pony now. Um, she's not a little kid's pony. Like she's she's um, she's a little bit tricky to deal with. Uh, but at the end of the day, she's just, uh, she's the cutest pony, but she's just dying to be understood. She has so much to say. And, uh, she, she just, she needs you to understand her before she'll kind of let you in and, and be your friend. So she's, she's got fantastic movement. Like she's a super little mover. She's, I actually bought her thinking she was going to be like, that was going to be my next dressage project. She's, got this amazing trot um but she's uh I don't know the best way to describe her she's sparkly (laughs) like she she likes to kind of you know show herself off and I think I think sometimes that comes off as her being a little bit hard um difficult to handle but it's just it's anyone who's who rides Connemara's know that kind of they're they're all like woohoo but they're not actually going to do anything about it they're just they're the most showy offy ponies I've ever seen so um that's kind of Stella um in a nutshell but she she also can get really shut down as well um in the moments that she seems like she's 
a very quiet pony. That's not her. And I've now come to realize that that's, those are the moments in which she's tuned me out because I've become far too much for her to, yeah. to manage at that point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So she's, she's 13. Like I said, she's kind of 13 going on six because she, when I bought her, um, she was very lightly started. I think she'd been sat on maybe twice. Um, she was started by a lady who does a lot of driving. So she was beautifully started. Um, she had done a lot of, of um, long, long lining with her. She had actually pulled like tires around and things like she had done all those things that you would get a horse doing if you're going to start them to drive. And then when she was sat on, um, she was ridden very quietly and very nicely. So she came to me kind of as a nice blank slate with no, um, no bad habits at all. Um, she wasn't backed until she was five. So she, you know, she was pretty much ready to go. And uh, that's the stage she's been at ever since I got her. <laughs> yeah. Just yeah. because of like one kind of health issue after another. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We've never got every time we just kind of get to the point where we're ready to go. It seems like she develops an ulcer or she founders. <laughs> Yeah, 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 we've been a little bit stuck in a rut there. Yeah, and so that's um that's part of the journey that you share in your horse and human wellness project, which is um a blog and also being turned into a book, which we're going to share the links for in the podcast notes. Um, did you want to tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. So um. In this journey that I've been on to try and make my pony love me, um, <laughs> which I'm still not sure she does, by the yeah. way. So spoiler alert. Um, I started doing a lot of things that I had never done before. Um, I've always been just kind of a straightforward rider. Like I, I grew up in pony club. I you know, I groom the horse, I get on, I ride, we do our thing, I muck out my bride, like, you know, just the normal way that people go about being horsey. Um, and then after I got Stella, um, I realized that something had to change and that she wasn't going to love me just because I was feeding her and mucking out her stable. Like I was going to have to actually get through to this pony. Um, so I started trying a lot of different methods that I wouldn't typically use. Um, I went down a few rabbit holes. Um, I looked at the whole, um, you know, like natural horsemanship and liberty work and all of those things that, you know, a good little pony club kid would never really <laughs> be thinking about. And I was trying so many different things. And I, I remember thinking to myself, like, I really need to keep track of what I'm doing here because I don't feel like I'm getting anywhere. So I started just, um, you know, every day or kind of every once a week or whatever, I would sit down on my computer and I would just kind of journal about what I had tried or something neat that I'd figured out or something that just didn't work. Um, and then I turned that into a little bit of a blog and got a bit of a following. So that was kind of fun. Um, and then I, uh, I was just sitting one day and I was going through all of all of these blog entries that I had posted over, you know, the last four years or whatever, because you get to that point and you're like, have I really gotten anywhere? Have I really yeah. made a difference here? Yeah. And I feel like the best way to to kind of make sure that you have gotten somewhere is to keep track of how you got there. So I sat down one day and I went right back to the beginning of all these blog posts and I was reading and reading and reading. And I thought like, this is pretty cool. Like we, we've done some interesting things. Not all of them were great things, but we've done some interesting things. Um, and yeah, that's when I thought I'd just kind of put it all together and and put it in a book. And really what I wanted from this book was I wanted for Stella to be famous. I wanted her to be on the cover of a book. Yeah. Um, so so the, the Horse and Human Wellness Project cover is Stella. Yeah. Um, so she's That's not famous. That's a beautiful photo of her as well. <laughs> It's, yeah, I love that photo. I took it with my iPhone. Every single picture I have, I took with my iPhone. And uh, yeah, no, she looks pretty fancy there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you came in we were one of your rabbit holes 
Yes. <laughs> you came in. Luckily, you were my last rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> you came into our Stronger Bond workshop and we're hooked. And you joined Training Trainability and our beta version of Green to Self Carriage. And you've been on, on the journey with us ever since. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, that's been a real, um, it's interesting. I was kind of at my wits end when I found you and Sarah. Um, and, and I really didn't know how to go forward. Um, I was, I didn't realize yet at that point how important the relationship building was and how how much I hadn't built that yet. Like I, th I thought things were going pretty well and, you know, Stella was healthy and sound. So I was actually at the point where I was ready to get to work with her. You know, I was riding her and um, kind of spiraling a little bit in my riding. And then I came upon um, you guys, <laughs> thank goodness, equestrian movement. Um, and at first I had, um, I had thought, well, this is, this will be a great way to get some ideas for my riding with her and, you know, to kind of figure out where I'm going with that. And then I got sucked into the whole relationship bit because you guys were just running your, um, it may have been your first Stronger okay. Bond workshop. Yeah. And uh, I was like, oh, well, I'll sign up for this because, you know, that's what I do. I sign up for things. And I was, I was hooked. I was hooked from the very beginning. I was like, holy moly, I haven't really even been thinking about relationship. Like all this time that I thought I was building a relationship. Yeah, yeah no, I had, a, I realized then I had a lot of work to do. It's, um, I think I was probably in the same position, to be honest. I had always worked on relationship with my horse's um more so not so much the relationships but like I knew that if there was a problem with my horse that was my fault and so it was right. always like a journey of self-reflection and growth for for me which I think in turn is what brought like the relationship aspect to it because rather than trying to change the horses I was always trying to change myself um but I think like you know Sarah really kind of brought that to the forefront she was the queen of being like no we need to we need to do this this the relationship is the best part I was like oh yeah okay obviously it is but do people even want that because <laughs> I come from such you know a, a strict background of riding and training right. and discipline and showing and you know the idea like me having a relationship with my horse was almost naughty like I would sneak <laughs> the time that I was supposed to be training to like sit with my horse yeah. and have cuddles. <laughs> like that was the part that that was me being rebellious. Is like I don't want to train today, so I <laughs> sit on the fence and pat my pony. <laughs> right. <laughs> I know it's so true. Like we really did, um, you know, kind of the background that you and I both come from. It wasn't normal to just go and like hang out in the paddock with your horse like that wasn't that was a waste of time like yeah. get get tacked up get riding you know yeah. so that's yeah. funny your, your horse you rebel anything doing nothing <laughs> <laughs> exactly. then, like the first advice that piece of advice I gave me how long have you spent doing nothing with your horse <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah so um you joined us um in the Stronger Bond workshop. And then you started working through the processes that we have together from memory. You were actually like still at that stage where you were a bit scared of Stella and she'd, she'd keep spooking. Yeah, yeah, she was, um, she was really spooky. She was um, kind of hyper vigilant all the time. I was afraid to take her out of the paddock. So our setup is really cool. Um, we've we've got um, our stalls open right up into the paddock that they all share. And that paddock is a pretty small space. Like it's probably the size of a typical riding ring. Um, and then we've got 
um, you know, some pasture fenced off. And then there are some really nice paths out all, all the way around the pastures. And I was afraid to take her, I was afraid to take her out through the gate of the paddock. Like I, um, I think that up until that point, I don't know if I had ever taken her outside the paddock since I brought her to this farm. Um, she was, she was spooky. She was reactive. She would run into me. She would always spook into me. Um, so she had knocked me down before she had, um, you know, she, she could rear, like she, she had all these moves that uh, just terrified me. So I couldn't, even fathom the day that I could actually take her outside the paddock um, to do any work with her. I was, I was pretty scared. I don't mind saying. Yeah, I do. I do remember a couple of those um, conversations that we had together and how excited you were when you did get out of the <laughs> <laughs> that, that was such a big day and you guys are the only ones who understood how that yeah, I was. <laughs> yeah. And now she's so good at exploring and being confident that she went and pricked her nose on. Do you guys have porcupines over there? Uh, we do. Talk? We have we have porcupines, and they. It's funny because we actually have this one porcupine that I guess just lives here now. Yeah. Um, anyway, it doesn't, it, it kind of just wanders about the place, but, and we thought it was really cute. Like it would sometimes come pretty close to the fence and we'd be like, oh, thank goodness the horses aren't, you know, aren't curious about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah. So one day I went down to the barn. Um, it was a Sunday evening and it was just getting dark and I thought I'd do a little bit of work with Stella so I went over and I was kind of you know hey how you doing and I went to put her halter on and she flew backwards and I was like what like we've been working on this for years this is the one thing that we've gotten really good at why won't you let me put your halter on and then I got closer and she wouldn't let me touch her face at all and then I looked a little closer and she, yeah she had porcupine quills in her in her muzzle so she obviously was you know curious enough that she thought she'd go and make friends with the porcupine which bad idea yeah I'm not <laughs> too sure. thing. like she couldn't even she couldn't even eat like she would try to go and eat her hay and she'd be like oh that hurts so anyway yeah a little bit over curious now I yeah would say. I, I didn't um quite understand how it could be the potential for going the wrong way with the teaching curiosity, <laughs> the confidence through curiosity. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's got to be a line there that, you yeah. know. No. But, but again, you know, it's, 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 it's neat because at one point she would have, there's no way she would have gone and sought out this crazy prickly little animal that was wandering around her paddock, you know, she would have run around and snorted and yeah. and whatnot so she's yeah she's a pretty cool pony now yeah that's good <laughs> um so what has been your biggest win or learning or aha moment since um using the program um I think for me the the biggest aha mo moment and this is for I think all of the all of the programs I've worked with you on. So for either the training chain ability, but especially for um, the green to self carriage was you have to set the bar way lower than you thought mm. you should. Yeah. You have to make it impossible for them to fail yeah. um, and make it impossible for yourself to fail. Um, and I think that's, I think that's what people forget. Like if you're, if you're trying to teach something, and we all know this with horses, if you're trying to teach something, you have to break it down. And then what I learned is that then you have to break it down more and then break it down more and then break it down more yeah. so that the bar is so low that all they need to do is just step over it and you've got to win and they feel good and you feel good. Yeah. Um, and I think that's what, that's what changed for me the most was, you know, I had this big picture in my head of where I wanted to get to and I couldn't for the life of me figure out how to get there um and and so the the biggest aha was that first day when it's like all I had to do 
was go out and get my pony to walk when I walked and stop when I stopped. And I remember thinking like, that's crazy. Like, this is never going to get us anywhere. And then I was like, oh, she did it. Oh, look how proud she is of herself. Okay, this worked. (laughs) And that's an exercise that seems so simple. Um, But I use it every day. I use it with every single horse that I ride. The very first thing I do is check to see um, if they're if they're connected with me, if they'll walk when I walk and stop when I stop. Um, so yeah, that's the, my biggest takeaway was just, um, when you think you've broken it down small enough, break it down even smaller, make it impossible to fail. Yeah. I love that. That's so good. (laughs) I think, um, you know, a lot of it is also our emotional attachment to the results. I catch myself on it all the time and just like, I don't do it so much with my horses but if I'm working with others and their expectations of what I should be able to achieve with a certain horse and like feeling the pressure of of meeting those expectations it's like the horse can only learn what the horse can only learn and they can only do what they do and putting the pressure on and creating that pressure cooker environment for them is what like sets everything off and what causes the behavioral problems and you know makes it basically impossible for the horse to learn and so they just learn to react and hope that they get the right answer in the best case scenario worst case scenario they're reacting to protect themselves and so it's right like you have to check your ego at the gate and (laughs) If the best thing you achieve for the day is the horse walks up to you, then you have to take that as a win. <laughs> it, no, it's it's so true. And I remember when I first got Stella, um, she, I mean, like I said, she, I, I didn't know her at all. And so this behavior that I was seeing, which now we know was because she had a big nasty ulcer, Um, I didn't know if that was her normal personality or not. And I just, I kind of just ignored it because my way of working through that with a horse that I was training would be just to get on with it. Like, we'll just, we'll just get through this and it's, it's going to get better um, the more I ride. And yeah, that was absolutely the worst thing I could have done. You know, I, I took her from the thing about Stella is that she, I got her when she was six. She had never been off the farm where she was born. Um, she was, you know, she was bred there. She was born there. She ran in the pasture with her mother, who was the head mayor of the whole herd. And, uh, you know, she had this idyllic little life that never, she, she never had pressure. She never had new things. She just went through life. And I didn't realize by taking her out of that and putting her in what I thought was a very normal situation, Um, I didn't realize that without having any kind of relationship with her, she had nothing to draw on. She had nothing to, nobody to look to. Um, And I think that's the biggest difference now is that, you know, if she's worried about something, she looks to me and I say, "Mm, this is really nothing. And she goes, oh, well, I guess this is really nothing. I'll just go touch it with my nose. (laughs) (laughs) Even if it's a horse Um, but yeah, without that, without that relationship, um, if you run into trouble, you're really in trouble. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Cause the only, they only have themselves to rely on then. And so they either run or attack. <laughs> right. Yeah. Those are the two options. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I lost my, my train of thought, but that's okay. <laughs> we regularly do that (laughs) um so what have you loved about the program the members the the, uh, membership uh what don't I love um (laughs) it's it's I always sound a little gushy when I talk about it but it's so true um the first of all Um, it's so nice to be a part of a group of people who are all working toward the same thing. And that same thing is not necessarily that they're working toward going to a dressage show or, you know, jumping a three plus six ox or whatever it is. We're all working toward trying to get to that place where um, our horses trust us and we trust them. 
So you're kind of um, being in the membership is really cool because everyone in there, um, if I go into the group and I say, you know, I'm having a crummy day and here's what happened. The amount of support you get is overwhelming. It's like everybody kind of jumps in and, and it's not like you should try this or you should try this. It's like, oh no, I'm so sorry. How Stella, you know, it's, it gives you this whole group of people who are really, you're invested in them and they're invested in you because we're all going through this together. Mm -hmm. um, so that's very cool. But, you know, besides that, um, because it's not just a big love fest, even if it was, I'd still love it. If that's all it was, I would still love it. But um, it's, you can, I think I've, I have a, a bit of a, of an advantage because I have been there from the start, but there's this really progressive set of lessons um, going on in tandem with that. So like, you know, you you're in there and you're, you know, here's, here's what we're working on this week, or here's something to try, or here's where this horse is at now. Um, you know, here's an exercise that I tried with Biddy. You might want to try it. So there's all of this, um, you know, kind of it's, I won't say it's step by step because, you know, it's all very circular. We know this, but whatever you're stuck on, you can go into the, into the group and just start going back through the videos and say, Oh, right. That's where she worked on this. Okay. That's what I'm going to try now. So along with the, here's how you progress through this program. There's also all of this other stuff going on in there for you to draw on and for you to find. So when you get stuck, everything's kind of right there for you. So that coupled with, um, the uh, incredible amount of emotional support that I draw from the people in the group as well. And from you guys, um, it's kind of, it's kind of this really perfect storm for me. It kind of brings everything together. So hmm. I think you asked for one thing that I loved about the membership <laughs> and I think that was ten things, but that's how I roll. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think um, definitely I try to make sure that if I don't have a video on the place that you're stuck, I find a horse that is also stuck there. <laughs> like, yeah, that is, that is a really cool thing. Like, oh, okay, well, let me just try that with somebody and I'll video it. And then all of a sudden here it is. Yeah. I do like that. Yeah. And <laughs> once, once you guys have been in the membership for a little bit and I can get an idea for like the horse's personality, I can generally kind of pick out of the horses I'm working with something that's going to be a little bit similar in how they respond right. like we can never get it like exactly the same scenario and set up but um I can kind of pick the horses that I'm working with that have a similar temperament so we can understand like if right. they have a flighty response or a dominant response or you know a pushy response and um figure out best tactics to resolve right. that around to a yes <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, it's, I think that's, um, that's maybe one of the coolest things. And I remember um, when I started working with, so of course Stella's lame right now, so we're not working, but I do have the opportunity to ride a friend of mine's horse once a week while she's away, uh, which has been great. And I had ridden this horse before. Um, I've, I've known the horse for a long time and I've hopped on him many, many times before. And I've always been a little bit stymied by a few of the things he did. And so then because I'm in this group and because I just started riding him again, I think you'll remember, like I took full advantage <clears throat> and videoed that first ride. And I was kind of like, blah, here, Katie, here's yeah. what's going on. Yeah. Um, and like, where else can you do that? Like, I just, I just. Um, here's this 30 minute long video. Can you please pick out the spots where I'm going wrong and, yeah. and help me? And like you did, yeah. and, you know, back to me two days later came this video with voiceovers. Um, so that's really cool too. Um, the, the neat thing about, um, about all the stuff that you do, but especially for um, green to self carriage, I find is that this truly is applicable to any horse. And no matter what level you're at, like this, this horse I'm riding, Philip, he's, you know, he's pretty far advanced. Like we, you know, he's, he's doing probably, you know, first level dressage, like he's, but because I've gone through um, the system and because we have 
a system that's very, um, you know, built on building blocks, I can actually go back through and pick out the places where the holes are in his training and then just start again from there. Um, whereas if you're, I think if you're working on your own, I know if I were working on my own, I'd be like, man, it drives me when he gets so heavy on my right rein. Oh, well. And you just keep, <laughs> I'm just going to keep doing this circle and hope it gets better. Yeah. Um, but, but now I can go back and say, oh, that's why, because we're missing this. Okay, well, let's start from here and work forward. Yeah. So um, that, that I found really cool. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I think it's, you know, we harp, harp on so much about revisiting foundations and doing the easy stuff, but it's because like you get, when you get to that point that you're stuck, you kind of can't really stay there and you have to come back and find something yeah. easier. Like just trying to push through the stuck part just gets you more stuck and then more stuck and then more stuck. Whereas if you can like yeah. come back and, and fill in like little, and it, it's like, you know, the, the nuances of the, the person that has ridden a halt transition for first time ever to the person that's ridden a halt transition after riding a year to the person who has ridden a halt transition after 10 years of riding to the person who like is a professional trainer breaker whatever riding communicating a halt transition like the the way that the basics evolve just because it's so repetitive and and happen like it's the person that has been doing you know 50 years of halt transitions has such a <laughs> more thorough understanding of what a halt is than you know, the person that, that's ridden it the first time. And it's like, you know, that that place that you're stuck at, at that advanced level is because you haven't been in a position to understand the refinement required of the easy stuff to get to that next level of advancement. And I think it like yeah. it translates to, you know, if you're a dancer or any any kind of discipline that you've, put like your heart and soul into like as a dancer you, you know you start with the basic movements but if I went and did a dance movement now I'd plot around like a hippo and nothing about it would be graceful <laughs> and it would be like years of isolating like muscle movements and then trying to you know integrate yeah. them and create flow and then isolate and integrate and flow and then add communication on top of it with an animal that doesn't speak our language. And, you know, that's where I used to hate halt transitions. I never did them with <laughs> I used to be like, why doesn't my horse stop? Oh, well. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to work on it because it sucks because my horse doesn't listen to stopping. <laughs> So I'd just be like, oh, we're definitely going to get a five for our halt. So we'll just make all the others. Yeah. It's really good. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, we'll just, we know that that's going to be the way it's going to be. So just carry on. Yeah. No, it's it's so true that I can't remember. Um, I, I remember a long time ago, um, I was reading a book by a dressage trainer. And I don't remember, I honestly don't remember who it was. Um, and if anyone has heard this quote and knows who it was, let me know. Um, but he has said that in dressage, every problem is a fundamental problem. You yeah. can trace it right back to the very basic, you know, go and stop movements. Um, and I think that we forget that, especially um, if you're riding a lot of different horses or if you're training or if you're um, kind of in that assembly line production sort of riding school frame yeah. of mind. Um, where, you know, you just want to get through the day without too many kids falling off and you do whatever <laughs> you have to do to get there. Yeah. Um, we forget that it's, it's not just okay to go back to basics, but we all should be going back to basics all the time. Yeah. Um, and I, I see it a lot in um, kind of upper level riders um, who have gotten to the point they are very quickly, like say they've gone out and gotten themselves a really nice horse and they've kind of rushed through. Um, and you look at just, you know, the way they're sitting, the way they're holding the reins, the way they're applying their aids. And you think like, wow, like that's, they need to go back and take some, 
you know, take some time and, and sort that out. But I, you know, everyone gets so caught up in the end goal. And it's like you said, you have to stop. Um, you have to disassociate yourself from the expectation of where you're going to be um, and really look at what is happening with this horse that I'm sitting on right now. Um, you know, why, why is this happening? What happened before that? What happened before that? What happened before that? And go right back to the start. Um, I remember, uh, I think Anna Blake, one time I heard her say, you know, starting over is miraculous. Mm -hmm. Starting over is the thing we should do all the time. Um, you know, there's, I think there's a bit of a stigma involved in going back to the basics. And, and it's true, like you said, we have to check our ego at the door because we don't want to, I was at the barn yesterday riding this Philip horse. And uh, the first thing we did is I just put a pole out in the middle of the ring. And we went out and we walked over the pole. And then we backed up over the pole. And we walked over the pole and we back. And people are walking by thinking like, what is she doing? <laughs> She's wasting valuable riding time here. Um, but that was something that, you know, that was a hole he had in his education. He'd never really learned properly to back up. So you have to just say, you know, I don't, I don't care if I look like a beginner who doesn't know what they're doing for a second here. I have to, I have to go and work on this. Mm. I definitely have a really similar experience that sticks out to me with the warm blood that I was competing dressage in. And I always, always had a lot of resistance in the right rein. And one day I just decided to have a muck around ride and ride him in a halter and he couldn't turn right. And this was like after three years of riding him, I was like, this horse doesn't actually know how to follow the rain. <laughs> doesn't actually know how to turn right. And that's why I always have so much resistance to the right rain. And <laughs> if I had have like checked my ego and gone back to the basics, you know, a couple of years earlier, yeah. I would have avoided all of that heartbreak about why won't he go light on the inside rain? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, every problem is a fundamental one. <laughs> That's, I think, I remember when I first started um, taking Stella through the green to self carriage, um, we had that, that moment very early on because, um, you know, we had, there's a lot of groundwork that, you know, you need to get through. And, and one of those things was, um, you know, follow the rain. I was like, oh, come on. Like, <laughs> and, you know, same kind of, same kind of situation. I remember being in the group and I remember saying to you one day, um, talk about an ego check. I remember saying like, I just can't get Stella to do leg yields. And you're like, well, how's her turning? <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah. Right. Better make sure she knows how to turn first. I, I mean, it's fundamental it's, problem. And it's not just, um, you know, for us, we kind of go in it with the expectations, like the horse should know what it's doing. But I also, you know, when you learn to ride on educated horses, you don't realize that there's this whole like learning curve that the horse needs to go through. And those educated horses are going through the same thing day in and day out with different riders. Like they're getting the most thorough education a horse can get. You move off a school horse to say like Stella, who's only been ridden twice. And you think that she understands how to follow the rein, but that's like you know, a good six to 12 months of practicing follow pressure, follow pressure away from my leg, follow pressure. Follow pressure away from my leg. There's just like so much rep repetition that has to go into really consolidating that for a horse, especially for like quick learners like Stella. Like you'll get it and then be like, right, she's got it. And you'll be like, let's move on to the next thing. And then yeah. it's as the aids compound, and this is always like the trickiest part when we start to get to the more complex aids and you're combining, say, like a half fold, which is like, your legs and your reins at the same time like how is your horse supposed to know which one to listen to they don't understand that we're creating a whole new word to them and half the yeah 100 percent of the time when you're introducing that you will always lose the brakes or the forward and so you know you're coming back to that foundation stop go stop go now put it together okay we broke the brakes stop go stop go put it together okay we broke the forward <laughs> come back <Stop. laughs> okay it's like 
so so much of it is just like an art form of repetition until the horse is like so super solid that they can't miscommunicate what we're trying to say to them yeah yeah and you have to I think you have to be careful um because like you say it is this is a long long process um and you know what I was trying to do with Stella I was literally missing six months of solid work that should have gone into it before that but we get caught up in this whole idea of where the horse should be now yeah um you know and I'm thinking like this horse I mean at the time she was what 10 I'm like she's 10 like we should be whatever we should whatever I thought we should be doing at the time um it's so easy to get caught up in that and to compare yourself to other people um and you know I was I lived under this constant pressure of like you know what's her breeder gonna think I haven't even gotten her to a show yet like what's my coach gonna think I and you know what's the person down the road gonna think as they're driving by watching me <laughs> walk forward and stop and walk forward and stop <laughs> and we have to it's I, I think that's another reason why it's so important to um kind of to be part of a group of people who understand um, because no matter what, at the end of the day, I can come back into the group and say like, you know, wow, we had the best halt transition today <laughs> and not worry about the fact that they might be thinking, well, you know, your horse is 13, so <laughs> <laughs> she should probably know how to halt. Um, and I think sometimes too, like social media plays into it a lot because, um, you know, you're looking on Insta and you're like, oh, this person is doing this and you know, look at this fancy person. Um, and then you go out into the backyard and, you know, haul in your muddy little pony to practice backing up over a pole. And you're thinking like, oh man, like this fail. <laughs> um, so it is, it's good to have the support of people who understand that, you know, you really do have to go back to the basics um, on a regular basis. It's, again, it's, it comes down to ego. Like we really have to stop thinking, um, that the achievements that you get are a reflection of you because they're not a lot of that is just luck what's the reflection of you is your horse yeah. and how they feel about what they're doing at any given time mm -hmm. so I think protecting that um, you know being an advocate for your horse and where they are at the moment and um, protecting that kind of fragile string that's holding you together I think that's what we need to start um, to start really putting out there rather than, you know, pictures of big fancy horses with their noses cranked into their chests or mm. whatever's the popular thing yeah. right now. So, yeah. yeah. So if you could give any advice to horse owners that might be in a similar situation now to where you were, what would you say? Huh. <laughs> <laughs> first thing I say is just chill out don't worry it's all gonna be fine <laughs> um this is there's nothing that's going on that can't be fixed um so that's you know that's the first thing I'd say because we do get really wound up about things and we're like oh you know this is this is awful I'm just gonna sell my horse and get a hamster instead don't do that <laughs> um because it's fixable um right the next thing I'd say I, I like how you always ask me for one thing and I give you like five, but <laughs> Good. Um, <laughs> the next thing I would say is um, find a place, find a group, find, um, you know, find your pack of people who are going to support you and who are going to remind you that you are the very best person to be working with your horse. Um, because I think back to, you know, when we're talking about aha moments, um, I think back to, I can remember the day that, I don't know if it was on that first Stronger Bond workshop, I don't know where it was, but you had said, you are the best person to be working with your horse. And up until that time, I thought the opposite. I thought, I'm not good enough to do this. I'm not brave enough to do this. I'm not educated enough to do this she would have been so much better off going to someone else and then Katie says to me no you're the best one to be working with her and I thought you know what I really am because I know where I'm getting to know her and I know what's important so so chill out understand you're the best person to be working with your horse but then find a program that is very um you know 
very focused on basics and fundamentals because you can't go wrong with that. Don't don't just go and seek out some trainer who's going to, you know, cowboy your horse into submission. Mm -hmm. Understand that you need to go back to the start and then find the program that's going to encourage and teach and allow you to do that. So those would be my my top three suggestions for anyone who's finding themselves in a situation where they just don't know what to do next and are thinking that they've made the biggest mistake of their lives. <laughs> <laughs> That's a little dramatic, but <laughs> uh, definitely. I feel if you haven't been there yet, you're going to get there. <laughs> Because <laughs> yeah. I'm there yeah, on, a, that's true. on a regular basis. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. So if people want to um, check out you and Stella's journey, and, you know, I think even just that resource of problem solving, those issues that are coming up, like understanding that they're not all training, like most of the time, training is the least of the problems most of the time you know we have to try and figure out like most of the time it's pain most of the time it's communication breakdown most of the time it's a communication breakdown where the horse is trying to communicate pain and so once yeah. you can once you like manage to troubleshoot all of the reasons why your horse physically can't do what you're asking them to do, the training process does get significantly easier. And then even more so once you get to know your horse as an individual, you understand how to, to motivate and encourage them and, and get those yeses instead of noes when you're working with them. So just like, you know, being in the trenches with you and going through your trial and error process and <laughs> it, and it is it's all a process of trial and error it's like is this the thing that's wrong with them oh no that's fine like what's the next thing on the list yeah and even that in <laughs> itself is like the signs that one horse might be giving for an issue compared to the signs another horse might be giving for the same issue that's confounding in itself and it's why our vets have such a problem as well and it's it's just you know once you know your horse and and you know that they're trying to communicate something if everybody's telling you that your horse is fine and just push them through it but you know that they're not you just got to keep digging and <laughs> digging and digging and digging and yeah. until you you kind of have a, either an answer or your horse like kind of starts being more engaged and, and willing and, and happy and, and positive and whatnot. And I think like we probably all need to be journaling this whole experience with our horses. <laughs> it's not yeah, easy. I'll, I'll add that to my, my list of things that you should do. Um, definitely we should be journaling and I, I'm not what I'm not really a journaling kind of person I I don't I've never been one to write down and I know we should always write down like notes after our lessons or whatever I've never been one to do that I've just you know I just kind of keep going and head down and move forward um writing this stuff all down was really one of uh, one of my biggest breakthroughs, like being able to not only just to keep track because we forget from day to day what we've done. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that's just the way the human brain works. We focus on the bad instead of the good. Um, if you can kind of get it down on paper when it's fresh in your head and before you've had a chance to think about it and assign emotions to it, yeah. um, you get a really true picture of, of where you are and what you've been through. Um, so I definitely, I have now become a journaling person. I write almost everything down and, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be like, as though someone else is going to read it, like the stuff that I wrote, even the stuff that's in my book, it wasn't written um, written for the consumption of people. It's just raw. That's how I felt at the moment that I was writing it down. Mm -hmm. um, I, th I think that's so important to be able to then a year later go back and say, oh, wow, like we really, 
we, we got something done here. We're, we're not struggling as much as we thought. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's super important. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And I think it's, it's good to know, you know, you're not in this alone. Everybody has problems. We are trying to communicate with a horse and we are trying to sit on their back and we are trying to find out all the reasons why they don't want us to do that. So <laughs> you're not alone in, in the journey. And I think it's even as an experienced rider who has been an instructor as well, like we all get stuck in the trenches there with trying to problem solve some of these issues. And, you know, it's, it's one thing to go into a Facebook group and say, why did my horse bark? And then it's a whole another kettle of fish of like just digging, digging, digging to kind of resolve behavioral issues and understand what your horse is trying to communicate. Yeah. 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 So, that's, I think that's the, the, the thing to remember is that they are trying to tell us something. Everything that they're doing is them trying to tell us something. Yeah. So if people want to um, continue your, watching your journey about um, with Stella, they'll learn a lot about laminitis at the moment. <laughs> um, but if they also would like to know the journey so far and purchase the book, we've got the link to the blog and the link to the book in the podcast notes. And we can always catch up with Pam in our Stronger Bond community. She's a very active member in there, helping everybody <laughs> out and sharing her Stella woes. <laughs> <laughs> it was so lovely chatting to you tonight. Oh, same. It's always good to catch up with you, Katie. Yeah. Well, I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Okay, bye.